I want to begin with an indisputable fact, namely that during the 19th century, unprecedented power compared to which the powers of Rome, Spain, Baghdad, or Constantinople in their day were far less form formidable, unprecedented power was concentrated in Britain and France, and later in other Western countries, the United States especially. This century, the 19th century, climaxed what has been called the rise of the West. And Western power allowed the imperial metropolitan centers at the end of the 19th century to acquire and accumulate territory and subjects on a truly astonishing scale. Consider that in 1800, Western powers claimed 55% but actually held approximately 35% of the Earth's surface. But by 1878, the percentage was 67% of the world held by the Western powers, which was a rate of increase of 83,000 square miles per year. By 1914, the annual rate by which the Western empires acquired territory had risen to an astonishing 240,000 square miles per year. And Europe held a grand total of roughly 85% of the Earth as colonies, protectorates, dependencies, dominions, and commonwealth, one of them, of course, being Canada. No other associated set of colonies in history was as large, none so totally dominated, none so unequal in power to the Western metropolis. As a result, says William McNeil in his book, The Pursuit of Power, and I quote, the world was united into a single interacting whole as never before. And in Europe itself, at the end of the 19th century, scarcely a corner of life was untouched by the facts of empire. The economies were hungry for overseas markets, raw materials, cheap labor, and profitable land. And defense and foreign policy establishments were more and more committed to the maintenance of vast tracts of distant territory in large numbers of subjugated peoples. When the Western powers were not in close and sometimes ruthless competition with each other for more colonies, and it's good to remind ourselves that the great historian of empire, VG, the Scottish historian of empire, V.G. Kiernan, has said, all modern empires imitate each other. When they were not in ruthless competition with each other for more, empire, for more colonies, they were hard at work settling, surveying, studying, and of course, ruling the territories under their jurisdictions. The United States experience was from the beginning founded upon the idea of an imperium, of an empire. The United States was founded as an empire, a dominion state or sovereignty that would expand in population and territory and increase in strength and power. There were claims for North American territory to be made and fought over with astonishing success. There were native peoples to be dominated, variously exterminated, variously dislodged. And then, as the American Republic increased in age and hemispheric power during the 19th century, there were distant lands to be designated vital to American interests, to be intervened in and fought over. For example, the Philippines, the Caribbean, Central America, the Barbary Coast, parts of Europe and the Middle East, Vietnam, and Korea. Curiously, though, so influential has been the discourse insisting on American specialness, altruism, and opportunity that imperialism in the United States as a word or ideology has turned up only rarely and recently in accounts of United States culture, politics, and history. But the connection between imperial politics and culture in North America, in particular in the United States, is astonishingly direct. American attitudes to American greatness, to hierarchies of race, to the perils of other revolutions, the American Revolution being considered unique and somehow unrepeatable anywhere else in the world. <laughs> These have remained constant, have dictated, have obscured the realities of empire, while apologists for overseas American interests have insisted on American in innocence, doing good, fighting for freedom. <coughs> Graham Greene's character, Pyle, in his novel of 19, I think, 51, The Quiet American, embodies this cultural formation with merciless accuracy. Yet for citizens of 19th century Britain and France, empire, unlike in America, 
empire was a major topic of unembarrassed cultural attention. British India and French North Africa alone played a tremendous role in the imagination, the economy, the political life, and social fabric of British and French society. And if we mention names like Edmund Burke, Delacroix, Ruskin, Carlyle, James and John Stuart Mill, Kipling, Balzac, Nerval, Flaubert, or Conrad, we would be mapping only a tiny corner of a much larger reality than even their immense collective talents cover. There were scholars, administrators, travelers, traders, parliamentarians, merchants, novelists, theorists, speculators, adventurers, visionaries, poets, and every variety of outcast and misfit in the outlying possessions of these two imperial powers, each of whom contributed to the formation of a colonial actuality existing at the heart of metropolitan life. Now, as I, as I shall be using the term imperialism for me, and I'm not really too interested in you know, terminological uh, adjustments, imperialism means the practice, the theory, and the attitudes of a dominating metropolitan center that rules a distant territory. Colonialism, which is almost always a consequence of imperialism, is the implanting of settlements on distant territory. As the historian Michael Doyle puts it, empire is a relationship, formal or informal, in which one state controls the effective political sovereignty of another political, of another political society. It can be achieved by force, by political collaboration, by economic, social, or cultural dependence. Imperialism, Doyle continues, is simply the process or policy of establishing or maintaining an empire. In our time, direct colonialism of the kind, for example, the British in India or the French in Algeria and Morocco, direct colonialism has largely ended. Yet imperialism lingers where it often has been in a kind of general cultural sphere, as well as in specific political, ideological, economic, and social practices. Now, the point I want to make is that neither imperialism nor colonialism is a simple act of accumulation and acquisition. It's not just a matter of going out there and getting a territory and sitting on it. Both of these practices, imperialism and colonialism, are supported and perhaps even impelled by impressive cultural formations that include ideas that certain people and certain territories require and beseech domination. For example, if you look at some of the writings about India in England in the 19th century, from the middle to the end of the 19th century, you realize that India existed in order to be ruled by, by England. <laughs> Strange. That, and as Kipling said, in, or at, represented it in, one of, in some of his writing, in his novels, and in his novel, Kim principally, but also in some of the short stories, you know, without, and he has Indian characters say that, without, without the English, India would disappear. It would just not be the same place. <laughs> so that these people and territories require domination as well as forms of knowledge that are affiliated with domination. The vocabulary of classic 19th century imperial culture in places like England and France is plentiful with words and concepts like inferior or subject races, the notion of subordinate people, the notion of dependency, the notion of expansion and authority. Out of the imperial experiences, notions about culture were clarified, reinforced, criticized, or rejected. As for the curious but perhaps allowable idea propagated about 100 years ago by the English historian J.R. Seeley that some of Europe's overseas empires were originally acquired by accident, it doesn't by any stretch of the imagination account for their inconsistency, persistence, and systemized acquisition and administration, let alone their augmented rule and sheer presence. As David Landis has said in his book, The Unbound Prometheus, which is about the industrial expansion of Europe in the 19th, early 19th century, the decision, I quote, the decision of certain European powers to establish plantations, that is to treat their colonies as continuous enterprises, was, whatever one may think of the morality, a momentous innovation. 
the primacy in the 19th century of the British and through most of the 20th of the British and the French empires by no means obscures the quite remarkable modern expansion of Spain, Portugal, Holland, Belgium, Germany, Italy, Japan, and in a different way, Russia and the United States. Russia, however, acquired its imperial territories almost exclusively by adjacents. That is to say, taking territories that are east or south of the actual borders of Russia. Unlike Britain or France, which jumped hundreds of miles, thousands of miles beyond their own borders to other continents, Russia moved to swallow whatever lands or people stood next to its borders, which in the process kept moving further and further east and south. But in the British and French cases, the sheer distance of attractive territory summoned the projection of far-flung interests. And that is my focus here, partly because I'm interested in examining the cultural forms and structures of feeling which it produces, and partly because overseas domination is the world I grew up in and we still live in. Russia's and America's superpower status, I should say the Soviet Union and the United States' superpower status, which was enjoyed for a little less than half a century, derives from very different histories and from different imperial trajectories than those of Britain and France in the 19th century. There are several varieties of domination and responses to it, but the Western one, along with the resistance it provoked, is in part the subject of my lecture. In the expansion of the great Western empires, profit and hope of further profit was obviously tremendously important, as the attractions of spices, sugar, slaves, rubber, cotton, opium, tin, gold, silver, over centuries amply testify. But so also was inertia, the fact that if you got there, you had to stay. The investment in already going enterprises, tradition, and market or institutional forces that kept the enterprise going. But there's more than that to imperialism. There was a commitment to imperialism over and above profit, a commitment in constant circulation and recirculation, which on the one hand allowed decent men and women from England or France, from London or Paris, to accept the notion that distant territories and their native peoples should be subjugated, and on the other hand, replenished metropolitan energy so that these decent peoples could think of the empire as a protracted, almost metaphysical obligation to rule subordinate, inferior, or less advanced peoples. We mustn't forget, and this is a very important aspect of my topic, I'm not sure I can get into it very much, but we mustn't forget that there was very little domestic resistance, that is to say, inside Britain and France. There was a kind of tremendous unanimity on the question of having an empire, so there was very little domestic resistance to imperial expansion during the 19th century. Although these empires were very frequently established and maintained under adverse and even disadvantageous conditions, not only were immense hardships in the, in the African wilds or wastes, the dark continent as it was called in the latter part of the 19th century, not only were Im immense hardships endured by the white colonizers, but there was always a tremendous risky physical disparity between a small number of Europeans at a very great distance from home and the much larger number of natives on their home territory. In India, for instance, by the 1930s, a mere 4,000 British civil servants assisted by 60,000 soldiers and 90,000 civilians had billeted themselves upon a country of 300 million people. The will, self-confidence, even arrogance necessary to maintain such a state of affairs can only be guessed at. But as one can see in the texts of novels like Forster's Passage to India or Kipling's Kim, these attitudes are at least as significant as the number of people in the army or civil service or the millions of pounds that England derived from India. For the enterprise of empire depends upon the idea of having an empire, as Conrad so powerfully, Joseph Conrad, so powerfully seems to have realized in Heart of Darkness. He says, you know, that it, the difference between us and the, in the modern period, the modern imperialists and the Romans, the Romans were there just for the loot. They were just stealing. But we go there uh, with an idea, 
And he was thinking, obviously, of the idea, for instance, in Africa of the French and the Belgians, that when you go to these continents, you're not just robbing the people of their uh, ivory and slaves and so on and so forth. You are improving them in some way. So the idea, no, I'm, I'm really quite serious. The idea, for example, of the French Empire was that France had a mission civilisatrice, that it was there to civilize the natives. It was a very powerful idea. Not, not so, I mean, obviously, not so many of the natives believed it, but the French believed that that's what they were doing. That's the point. The idea of having an empire is very important, and, and that is the central fe feature, I think, that I'm interested in. And all kinds of preparations are made for this idea within a culture. And then in turn, and in time, imperialism acquires a kind of coherence, a set of experiences, and a presence of ruler and ruled alike within the culture. Now, to a very great degree, the era of high 19th century imperialism is over. France and Britain gave up their most splendid possessions after World War II, and, le and lesser powers also divested themselves of their far-flung dominions. Yet, although that era ha clearly had an identity, which is, for example, Eric Hobsbawm in his book, the third book in the trilogy of the age, first the age of revolution, then the age of capital, the third volume is called the age of empire. He's talking about the latter part of the 19th century. Yet, Although the age of empire clearly had an identity all of its own, and historians roughly talk about it from 1878 to World War II, the meaning of the imperial past is not totally contained within it, but has entered the reality of hundreds of millions of people, where its existence as shared memory and a highly conflicted texture of culture, ideology, memory, and policy still exercises tremendous force. Franz Fanon says, we should, I quote, we should flatly refuse the situation to which the Western countries wish to condemn us. This is in 1961. Colonialism and imperialism have not paid their dues when they withdraw their flags and their police forces from our territories. For centuries, the foreign colonists have behaved in the underdeveloped world like nothing more than criminals, end of quote. A proper understanding of imperialism must take stock also in the present of the nostalgia for empire. That is to say, a number of, you still find it in the writings of French and English historians, for example, who regret the days that, that, and, and, and the idea that we, we had to give India up or that we had to withdraw from Algeria, this sort of thing. That, that still exists. And what also exists is the anger and resentment it provokes that the notion of, or the memory of empire, and those who were ruled and who see an empire nothing but an unmitigated disaster for the native people. So we must try to look carefully and integrally at the culture that nurtured the sentiment, the rationale, and above all, the imagination of empire. And we need also to understand the hegemony of the imperial ideology, which by the end of the 19th century had become completely embedded in the affairs of cultures whose less regrettable features we still celebrate. Thus, and I come now to the present, imperialism did not really end, did not suddenly become past. Once decolonization had set in motion the dismantling of the classical empires. A legacy of connections still binds countries like Algeria and India to Britain and France, respectively. A vast new population of Muslims, Africans, West Indians from former colonial territories now resides, for instance, in metropolitan Europe. Even Italy, Germany, and Scandinavia today must deal with these dislocations, which are to a large degree the result of imperialism and decolonization as well as expanding European populations. Also, the end of the Cold War and of the Soviet Union has definitively changed the world map. The triumph of the United States as the last superpower suggests a new set of force lines will structure the world, and they were already beginning to be apparent in the 1960s and 70s. Michael Barrett Brown, in a preface to the second edition of his book, After Imperialism, the book appeared in 1963, the second edition in 1970, argues 
that imperialism is still without question a most powerful force in the economic, political, and military relations by which the less economically developed lands are subjected to the more economically developed. We may still look forward to its ending." End of quote. It's ironic that descriptions of the new form of imperialism regularly employ idioms of gigantism and apocalypse that could not have as easily been applied to the classical empires of the 19th century. Some of these descriptions have an extraordinary dispiriting inevitability, a kind of galloping, engulfing, impersonal and deterministic quality. Look at some of the phrases used for the post-imperial imperialism. Accumulation on a world scale. Imperialism and dependency, or the structure of dependency. Poverty and imperialism. The repertory is very well known in economics, political science, history, and sociology, and has been identified less with the new world order than with members of a controversial left school of thought. Nevertheless, the cultural implications of such phrases and concepts are discernible, and alas, they are undeniably depressing to even the most untutored eye. What are the salient features of the representation of the old imperial inequities, the persistence in Arno Mayer's telling phrase, the persistence of the old regime? One certainly is the immense economic rift between the North and the South, between the poor and the rich states, whose basically quite simple topography was drawn in the starkest terms by the so-called Brandt, Willy Brandt report, which was entitled North-South, a program for survival. It was published in 1980. Its conclusions are couched in the language of crisis and emergency. It says that the poorest nations of the Southern Hemisphere must have their priority needs addressed. Hunger must be abolished, commodity earnings strengthened. Manufacturing in the Northern Hemisphere should permit the genuine growth in Southern manufacturing centers Transnational corporations should be restricted in their practices. The global monetary system should be reformed. Development finance should be changed to eliminate what has been called the debt trap. The crux of the matter is, as the report's phrase has it, power sharing. That is, giving the southern countries a more equitable share in power and decision making within monetary and financial institutions. Now, it's difficult to disagree with the Willy Brandt reports diagnosis, which is made more credible by its balanced tone and its silent picture of the untrammeled rapacity, greed, and immorality of the North, or even with the recommendations of the report. But how will the changes come about? The post-war classifications of all the nations into three worlds, the first world, the second world, the three world, that were originally coined by a French journalist in about 1950, has largely been abandoned. Willy Brandt, and his colleagues implicitly concede that the United Nations, an admirable organization in principle, has not been adequate, and doesn't seem today as if it is adequate, even now, to the innumerable regional and global conflicts that occur with increasing frequency. I mean, there's Yugoslavia and the United Nations is powerless, largely because uh, of the will of the so-called permanent members of the Security Council, principal among them, the United States. With the exception of the work of small groups, for example, the World Order Models Project, global thinking tends to reproduce superpower, Cold War, regional, ideological, or ethnic contests of old Yugoslavia. It's a perfect case in point. Even more dangerous in the nuclear and post-nuclear era, as the horrors of Yugoslavia attest. The powerful are likely to get more powerful and rich, the weak less powerful and poorer, and Africa, of course, is living testimony to this fact. The gap between the two, the North and the South, overrides the former distinctions between socialist and capitalist regimes that in Europe, at least, have become less significant. Noam Chomsky concludes that during the 1980s, and I quote, the North-South conflict will not subside, and I think it's true also of the 90s, and new forms of domination will have to be devised to ensure the privileged segments of Western industrial society maintain substantial control over global resources, human and material, and benefit disproportionately from this control. Thus it comes as no surprise, Chomsky continues, that the reconstitution of ideology in the United States, and I would say especially after the end of the Cold War, finds echoes throughout the industrial world. But it's an absolute requirement for the Western system of ideology that a vast gulf 
be established between the civilized West, this is all ironic, of course, the civilized West with its traditional commitment to human dignity, liberty, and self-determination, and the barbaric brutality of those for who, who, for some reason, perhaps defective genes, fail, <laughs> fail to appreciate the depth of this historical commitment, so well revealed by America's Asian wars, for instance. Chomsky's move from the North-South dilemma to American and Western dominance is, I think, basically correct, although the decrease in American economic power the urban economic and cultural crisis in the United States. For example, I think a lot of the discussion recently in America about the canon and you know, what is Western literature and all that stuff ha is connected to the reconstitution of ideology, I think. The decrease in American power and the, the cri these various crises in the United States as well as the ascendancy of Pacific Rim states like Taiwan and Japan and the confusions of a multipolar world have muted the stridency now of the Reagan and Bush period. For one, it underlines the continuity of the ideolo ideological need to consolidate and justify domination in cultural terms that has been the case in the West since the 19th century and even earlier. Secondly, it accurately picks up the theme based on repeated projections and theorizations of American power sounded in often very insecure and therefore overstated ways that we live today in a period of American ascendancies. Studies during the past decade of major personalities of the mid major American personalities of the mid 20th century illustrates what I mean. If you take the case of Walter Lippmann, you'll see in the career Walter Lippmann was the most famous pundit and journalist, really of the middle years of the of the 20th century. Lippmann represents the mindset of American ascendancy, as inscribed in the career of the most famous American journal journalist, the one with the most prestige and power of this century. The extraordinary thing about Lippmann's career is not that Lippmann was correct or especially perspicacious with regard to his reporting or his predictions about world events. He wasn't. But rather that from an insider's position, that is to say he was a man who stood near power and always tried to talk as if he was an insider, that from an inside position, he articulated American global dominance without demurral, except for Vietnam when he disagreed with LBJ. And he saw his role as a pundit to be that of helping his compatriots to make, as he said, an adjustment to reality, the reality of unrivaled American power in the world, which he made more acceptable by stressing its moralism, realism, and altruism with a remarkable skill for not straying too far from the thrust of public policy. In other words, what I'm trying to suggest is that the role of American power in the world really depends to a great deal, not just on the raw military power of the United States, because given the crises in health, in economics, in the universities, and so on, that flood the country, there is still a very powerful ideological, what I call cultural consensus in the country that suggests in the careers of people like Lippmann that America's role is to be the leader of the world. A similar view is found in the influential writing of George Kennan. He was, as you all know, the author of the containment policy that guided U.S. policy for much of the Cold War, Cold War period. Kennan believed his country to be the guardian of Western civilization. For Kennan, such a destiny in the non-European world implied no effort to be expended on making the United States popular. It's not important that the U.S. be popular. He called it Rotarian idealism. <laughs> but what it depended on was what he called straight power concepts. And since no formerly colonized people or state had the wherewithal to challenge the United States, this is all after the, the end of the classical empires, nobody had the power to challenge the United States militarily or economically. He cautioned restraint. Yet, in a memo written in 1948 for the policy planning staff of the State Department, he approved of the recolonizing, recolonizing of Africa. And also, in something he wrote in 1971, he also approved of apartheid in South Africa. He didn't approve of its abuses, he said, but he, the idea was a good one. <laughs> Although he did dis disapprove of the American intervention in Vietnam, and generally he approved of what he called a purely American kind of informal imperial system. There was no doubt in his mind that Europe and America were uniquely positioned to lead the world a view that caused him to regard 
his own country is a sort of adolescent growing into the role once played by the British Empire. Other forces shaped post-war U.S. foreign policy besides Lippmann and Kennan. Both of them were lonely men who were alienated from the mass society they lived in, who hated jingoism and the cruder forms of aggressive American behavior. They knew that isolationism, interventionism, anti-colonialism, free trade imperialism were related to the domestic characteristics of American political life, which was described by the historian Richard Hofstadter as uh, anti-intellectual and paranoid. These produced the inconsistencies, advances, and retreats of U.S. foreign policy before the end of World War II and certainly after it. Yet the idea of American exceptionalism and leadership is never absent, and this is the point I'm trying to make, that after the British and the French disappeared, and certainly in the period after World War II, the empires disappeared, America took over. And no matter what the U.S. does, these authorities often do not want it to be an imperial power like the others as it followed, preferring instead the notion of world responsibility. It's very different, but it's the same, in my opinion, the same thing as a rationale for what it does. Earlier rationales, the Monroe Doctrine, Manifest Destiny, and so on, lead to world responsibility, which exactly, cor uh, which exactly corresponds to the growth in the United States' global interests after World War II and to the conception of its enormous power as formulated by the foreign policy and intellectual elite. In a very clear account of what damage this has done, Richard Barnett notes that a U.S military intervention in the third world has occurred every year between 1945 and 1967. Since that time, the United States has been impressively active on the world stage, most notably during the Gulf War of 1991, when 650,000 troops were dispatched 6,000 miles away to turn back an Iraqi invasion of a U.S. oil-producing ally. Such interventions, says Barnett in his book, The Roots of War, have all the elements of a powerful imperial creed, a sense of mission, historical necessity, and evangelical fervor. He continues, the imperial creed rests on a theory of lawmaking. According to the strident globalists like LBJ and the muted globalists like Nixon, the goal of U.S. foreign policy is to bring about a world increasingly subject to the rule of law. But it is the United States which organizes the peace and defines the law. The United States imposes the international interest by setting the ground rules for economic development and military deployment across the planet. Thus, the U.S. set rules for Soviet behavior in Cuba, Brazilian behavior in Brazil, Vietnamese behavior in Vietnam. Today, America's self-appointed writ runs throughout the world, over whose territory the U.S. government has asserted... Oh, this is, he's talking about... the. Uh, the Soviet Union and China, over whose territory the United States during the Cold War asserted the right to fly military aircraft. The U.S., uniquely blessed with surpassing riches in an exceptional history, stands above the international system, not within it. Supreme among nations, she stands ready to be the bearer of the law. The amazing thing about this is not that it is attempted, but that it is done with so much consensus and near unanimity in, in a public sphere constructed as a kind of cultural space ex expressly to represent and explain this policy. In periods of great internal crisis, for example, a year or so after the Gulf War, this sort of moralistic triumphalism is suspended and put aside. Yet while it lasts, the media play an extraordinary role in manufacturing consent, as Chomsky puts it, in making the average American feel that it is up to us to right the wrongs of the world and the devil with contradictions and inconsistencies. The Gulf intervention was preceded by a string of interventions in Panama, Grenada, Libya. All of them widely discussed, most of them approved, or at least undeterred, as belonging to us by right. As Kiernan puts it, America loved to think that whatever it wanted was just what the human race wanted. <laughs> to complete this rather bleak picture, then, let me add a few summary observations about conditions in the third world. Obviously, we can't discuss the non-Western world as distinct from developments in the West. The ravages of colonial wars in Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, 
the protracted conflicts between nationalism and imperialist control, the disputatious new fundamentalists and nativist movements nourished by despair and anger, the extension of the world system over the developing world, these circumstances are directly connected to actualities in the West. On the one hand, as Iqbal Ahmed says in the best account of these circumstances that we have, the peasant and pre-capitalist classes that predominated during the era of classical colonialism have dispersed in the new states into new, often abruptly urbanized and restless classes tied to the absorptive economic and political powers of the metropolitan West. In Pakistan and Egypt, for example, the fundamentalists, the contentious fundamentalists, are led not by peasant or working class intellectuals, but by Western educated engineers, doctors, and lawyers. Ruling minorities emerge with the new deformations in the new structures of power. These pathologies and the disenchantment with authority they have caused run the gamut from the neo-fascist to the dynastic and oligarchic, with only a few states retaining a functioning parliamentary and democratic system. Now, for all its apparent power, this new overall pattern of domination, which is, in my opinion, a kind of replication or repetition, reproduction of the old imperial order, this new overall pattern of domination, which developed during the era of mass societies commanded at the top by a powerfully centralizing culture and a complex incorporative economy, this, I think, is basically unstable. And now I come to the part about the counter, as it were, discourse of the counter to imperialism. As a remarkable French urban sociologist, Paul Virilio, has said, this polity, the world in which we now live, is based on speed, instant communication, distant reach, constant emergency, insecurity induced by mounting crises, some of which lead to war. In such circumstances, he argues, the rapid occupation of real as, a, uh, as well as public space, colonization, becomes the central militaristic prerogative of the modern state, as the United States showed when it dispatched a huge army to the Arabian Gulf and commandeered the media to help carry out the operation. In other words, it's so unstable that if you feel threatened, six, your interests feel threatened, then you dispatch a huge army with this tremendous logistical capacity that you have, and you occupy and fight a war. As against that capacity of the modern imperial state, like the United States, Virilio suggests that the modernist project of liberating language and speech has a parallel today in the liberation of critical spaces, hospitals, universities, theaters, factories, churches, empty buildings, in both, the fundamental transgressive act is to inhabit the normally uninhabited. As examples, Virilio cites the cases of people who are kind of a counter to this imperial invasion. He cites the cases of people whose current status is the consequence either of decolonization, migrant workers, refugees, the Gastarbeitern, you know, in Germany, for example. They are the counter to imperialism because you have people coming from the third uh, or the southern world into the western metropolis and causing an unstable uh, instability at the center of the western metropolis. The people whose current status is the consequence either of decolonization, like the migrant workers and so on, or of major demographic and political shifts. Uh, blacks, immigrants, urban squatters, students, popular insurrections, and so on. These constitute a real alternative to the authority of the state. And then if the 1960s are now remembered as a decade of European and American mass demonstrations in the university uh, revolutions of the time, the 1980s must surely be the decades, the decade of mass uprisings outside the Western metropolis. Think of the places where there were mass uprisings in Iran, the Philippines, Argentina, Korea, Pakistan, Algeria, China, South Africa, virtually all of Eastern Europe, the Israeli-occupied territories of, of the West Bank and Gaza. These are some of the most impressive crowd-activated sites, each of them crammed with largely unarmed civilian populations, 
well past the point of enduring the imposed deprivations, tyranny, and inflexibility of governments that had ruled them for too long. The two general agreement, areas of agreement nearly everywhere are that personal freedom should be safeguarded and that the Earth's environment should be defended against further decline. Democracy and ecology, each providing a local context and plenty of com concrete combat zones, are set against a cosmic backdrop. Whether in the struggle of nationalities or in the problems of deforestation and global warming in the AIDS, ec AIDS ec epidemic, the interactions between individual identity embodied in minor activities like smoking or using of the usage of aerosol cans, and the general framework are tremendously direct, and the time-honored conventions of art, history, and philosophy don't seem well suited to them. Much of what was so exciting for four decades about Western modernism and its aftermath seems almost quaintly abstract, desperately Eurocentric today. More reliable now are the reports from the front line where struggles are being fought between domestic tyrants and idealist oppositions, hybrid combinations of realism and fantasy, cartographic and archaeological descriptions, exploration in mixed forms, the essay, the video or film, the photograph, the memoir, the story or aphorism of unhoused, exilic experiences. The major task, then, is to match the new economic and sociopolitical dislocations and configurations of our time with the startling realities of human interdependence on a, on a world scale. If the Japanese, East European, Islamic, and Western instances express anything in common, it is, and this is really what I'm most interested in, it is that a new critical consciousness, a kind of counter discourse to empire, is needed. And this can be achieved only by revised attitudes to education. Merely to urge students to insist on their own identity, their tradition, their history, their uniqueness, may initially get them to name their basic requirements for democracy and for the right to an assured, decently humane existence. But we need to go on and to situate the identities of our students and of ourselves in a geography of other identities, peoples, cultures, and then to study how, despite their differences, they have always overlapped with each other, through unhierarchical influence, crossing, incorporation, recollection, deliberate forget forgetfulness, and of course, conflict. We are nowhere near the end of history, but we are still very far, uh, we are still far from free of monopolizing attitude and imperial attitudes towards it. Notwithstanding the rallying cries of the politics of separatist identity, multiculturalism, minority discourse, and the quicker we teach ourselves to find alternatives the better and safer. The fact is, we are mixed in with each other in ways that most national systems of education have not dreamed of. To match knowledge in the arts and sciences with these integrative realities is, I believe, the intellectual and cultural challenge of our time. The steady critique of nationalism from the standpoint of real liberation should not be forgotten for we must not condemn ourselves to repeat the imperial experience, although all around us it is being repeated. How in the, very, in the redefined and yet very close contemporary relationship between culture and empire, a relationship that enables disquieting forms of domination, can we sustain the liberating energies released by the great decolonizing resistance movements and the mass uprisings of the 1980s? Can these energies elude the homogenizing processes of modern life? Can they hold in abeyance the interventions of the new imperial centrality? All things counter, original, spare, strange. This is a line from a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, which is called Pied Beauty. All things counter, original, spare, strange. The question is, where are all these things? And where to, we might ask, is there a place for that astonishingly harmonious vision of time intersecting with a timeless that occurs at the end of the last of the four quartets of Eliot, Little Gidding, a moment that Eliot saw, and I quote now, as words in an easy commerce of the old and new, the common word exact without vulgarity, the, the formal word precise but not pedantic, the complete consort dancing together. To recall now Paul Virilio, his notion of how you can do this, how you can 
live in a world that is counter original spare strange in which there are many different identities not yours alone and where you don't want to impose one domination on, on everyone Virilio's idea is what he calls counter habitation to live as migrants do in habitually uninhabited but nevertheless public spaces we can perceive this on the political map of the contemporary world for surely it is one of the unhappiest characteristics of our age to have produced more refugees, migrant, migrants, displaced persons and exiles than ever before in history. Most of them as a corollary to, and ironically enough, as afterthoughts of great colonial and imperial conflicts. As the struggle for independence produced new states and new boundaries, it also produced homeless wanderers, nomads, vagrants, unassimilated to the emerging structures of institutional power rejected by the established order for their intransigence and obdurate rebelliousness. Yet it's no exaggeration to say that liberation as an intellectual mission born in the resistance and opposition to the confinements and ravages of empire has now shifted from the settled, established and domesticated dynamics of culture to its unhoused, decentered and exilic energies, energies whose incarnation today is the migrant and whose consciousness is that of the intellectual and artist in exile, the political figure between domains, between forms, between homes, and between languages. From this perspective, then, all things are indeed counter-original, spare, strange. From this perspective, also, one can see, as Eliot says, the whole consort dancing together. And while it would be the rankest Panglossian dishonesty to say that the bravura performances of the intellectual exile and the miseries of the displaced person or refugee are the same, it is possible, I think, to regard the intellectual as first distilling, then articulating the predicaments that disfigure modernity, mass deportation, imprisonment, population transfer, collective dispossession, and forced immigrations. Lastly, no one today is purely one thing. Labels like Indian or Canadian or woman or Muslim or American are no more than starting points which if followed into actual experience for only a moment are quickly left behind. Imperialism consolidated the mixture of cultures and identities on a world scale. But its worst and most paradoxical gift was to allow people to believe that they were only, mainly, exclusively white or black or western or oriental. Yet just as human beings make their own history, they can also make their own culture. They also make their cultures and ethnic identities. No one can deny the persisting continuities of long traditions, sustained habitations, national languages, and cultural geographies. But there seems no reason except fear and prejudice to keep insisting on their separation and distinctiveness, as if that was all human life was about. Survival, in fact, is about the connections between things. In Eliot's phrase, reality cannot be deprived of the other echoes that inhabit the garden. It is more rewarding and more difficult to think concretely and sympathetically about others than only about us. But this also means not trying to rule others, not trying to classify them or put them in hierarchies. Above all, not constantly to reiterate how our culture or country is number one or not number one for that matter. For the intellectual, there's quite enough of value to do without that. Thank you.